But I think today it's going to be all squared away. And so right now, I want you to use this time. Please do me a favor. Let's try to get as many people as we can in this live so that we can have community, so that we can have questions, and hopefully I have answers to those questions. Um, but use this time right now to settle yourselves in. Share, share, share with your family, your friends, your coworkers, whoever you think this message would be useful for, because the reality is a lot of us are living unsatisfying lives. In fact, that's something my clients say all the time, or the people who come seeking me, they're saying, Amanda, I'm not happy with the results, with the outcome of my life. And so tonight I want to give you real answers to help you get to a satisfying life. Okay, so share, 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 get yourself settled in, and please grab a notepad, grab a pen, take notes. I am a paper and pen kind of gal, and uh, you know, in school I would always, everyone's on keyboards and whatever. Um, Renee got me this thing, which I'm still trying to figure out how to use, but grab your papers, grab your pens, or even write notes on the notepad on your phone, but have these notes so that you can look at it later and start applying it. I'm still having problems on this one, really. Ask, ask them if it's lagging on Instagram. Renee wants me to ask you if we are lagging on Instagram. Are we lagging on Instagram? How would I know? Yeah, but I can't see their response. Maybe I should try this one. Okay, I'm gonna try this phone. Let's see if this phone works. From here? From where? From this? From your phone. Okay, let's see. Here, do that. Okay, Renee's gonna try to get me figured out on Instagram so that I can interact and see what you guys are saying there. Um, and then we are going to get started. Let's see here. He wants me to disconnect from my Wi-Fi here. Okay. All right. So without further ado, if you're coming in, welcome. I can't see you, but whether you're coming from Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, welcome, welcome, welcome. Have your questions ready. I'm going to be able to see it very soon but thank you for engaging this week and answering those questions again those stories that i do the questions that i do um it's so that we can interact so i know exactly what to deliver to you every single wednesday at 8 p.m so here we go um we're gonna get started and i'm gonna do oh there we go now i now i see you guys now i have you guys so welcome those that are coming in it's good to have you guys here get those questions ready Please. So here we go. Look, to be human is to live for something. To be human is to be a creature that's oriented towards a goal. If you've been with us before, you know that something I always use is a word called telos. And telos means just that, goals. You and I, whether consciously or subconsciously, we are heading towards a direction. There is forward movement in us. Now, what I want you to remember, which is going to be said over and over and over again, because here we are trying to develop our characters. Why? Because character determines destiny. Characters determine destiny. And so here is the place that we are going to transform my character and your character so that we can get to where we're trying to go. That's why tonight we're going to see the one simple formula that is going to change your unsatisfying life to a satisfying life. But before we get there, this is the little formula that's said over and over and over again, which is this. Thoughts lead to actions, and you should know this by now. Thoughts lead to actions. Actions become habits. Habits form your character, and character leads you to your destiny, which is why character determines destiny. Now, the person that you are today, the person that you are right now, is not someone that you had to be, but someone that you chose to be. Today, you are living a destiny that was created years ago. So you are the person you are today because of the choices that you made yesterday, a week ago, a month, a year, five or 10 years. So I, I know it can be said that right now I am living out a destiny that was being cultivated, let's say, eight years ago when I went to school and I decided that I wanted to be a marriage and family therapist. And so eight years ago was my preparation to right now living out my destiny. Does that make sense? And so when I tell you that thoughts lead to actions, actions lead 
to habits and habits lead to character and character determine your destiny. I'm not talking about some future destiny, which there's also that, but I'm talking about the destiny that you are currently living out today, right now, based on the choices that you did weeks, months, or years ago. Welcome, welcome, Marley and I don't know how, what is that? Two by own designer, right? That's it. Welcome. I'm glad you guys are here. And so look, the reality is that most of us right now are not living satisfactory lives, okay? We are not content with the current results of our lives, with our current behaviors. And so there's an incredible little book that I read, I really, really like, and I highly recommend it. It's called Atomic Habits. And the man who wrote this book is James Clear. And in this book, he talks about three levels of behavioral change. He says when people do not like the results of their lives, when people are not satisfied with their outcomes, they try to change this. Obviously, of course, right? And maybe that's why you're here because you're unsatisfied with something in your life and you're thinking, well, what can I do to change my result, to change my outcome? And so he says that there are three levels of change. Renee has promised me a whiteboard. I still haven't received I still haven't received my whiteboard. He's telling me next week. Um, I'm not going to be able to, to put it on the whiteboard, but I drew it out for you. And I'm going to try to hold it up and maybe it'll work. Let's see if holding it up works. Does that work? Should I point it to another place? Oh, Renee's saying it's work. It's working. Okay, you guys on Instagram there. Can you guys see this pretty good? Well, look at that. So look, I if you have paper and pen, which I hope you do, right? Write this down. These are three levels of change. Now, on top there, it says outcome and then process and then identity, okay? So we have, thanks for the thumbs up there, Elisa Agostini. And so we have three levels of change, outcome, process, identity. Now here's the thing. When we are unsatisfied with our lives, usually the first thing we try to do is we want to focus on the outcome. I don't like this that's going on, whatever this is, A, B, or C. Now outcome focuses on changing your results. That's the first level of change. The second level of change, which you saw there is process, which focuses on changing your habits and your system. You want to implement something that's going to help you have different results. And finally, the third level of change is changing your identity, which focuses on changing your beliefs and what we're going to talk about here, ultimately changing your character. Okay. I'll use identity and character sort of interchangeably. Now, James Clear says this, I'm going to quote him directly. He says this, outcomes are about what you get process are about what you do, right? Outcome is I want to get to someplace else, my results. And so when you go to the second level of change, which is process, now you're saying, what am I going to do about it? Right? You put actions behind the thought and then identity is about what you believe. Now, all of these lessons, all, all of these levels, I should say are necessary. We need all three levels of change. However, what we are going to discover tonight, is that the key to lasting transformation, to lasting behavioral change, is to focus on who I want to be instead of what do I want to change. Tonight we're going to focus not so much on the first level of change, which is results, but I want you to start thinking about identity, beliefs, character transformation. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example. I had, and this is where all this stuff sort of started to dawn on me. And really it's kind of the, um, trial and errors as I, I guess a young therapist. Right. And so when, when I got out of school, I went to Nova Southeastern university. And when I got out of school and you start getting your, your early clients there, I, I was working with, with a gentleman and this was a couple of years ago. And it was one of the first questions that I like to ask my clients is, well, <laughs> why are you here, right? What do you want? Why are you here? Why did you take the next step? Because again, there are people who don't like the results and the outcomes of their lives, but then it just stays there. It's just the first level of change. And they say, I don't like it. I'm unsatisfied, but they don't do anything about it. But if the person came to me, now they're a second level of change. Now they're saying, I need to come up with a system. I need to come up with a game plan so that I can start to change my results. And so they come and do therapy. 
Now, when I asked the question to this gentleman that I was working with a couple of years ago, I said, what do you want? Why are you here? What do you want? And he answered, I want a happy family. That's what he said. I want a happy family. Now, what level of change is that? That's outcome, right? He was not happy with the results. He was not happy with his life. And so what he wanted was, I want a happy family. Now, he started doing therapy, second level of change. What was he doing? He was wanting and trying to implement habits and systems that would take him to his results. Are we following? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? But here's the catch and here's the problem. Everything was going well and we were implementing habits and we were implementing system and we were implementing change and you could see changes start to take place. You could see him start to pick up habits and do different things and act differently and behave differently. Why? Because that was his goal. That was his telos. That was his, what he wanted to be his destination. <laughs> but soon, although everything was going well, something happened. And this something was when he encountered a situation where he was face to face with identity, who he is versus who he thought he was. The problem was that what he thought he wanted wasn't really what he wanted. Although he was changing at the first and second level, he still had not yet changed at the third level, the identity level. And so this is how the story goes. <laughs> hey, Giselle, welcome, 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 all of you guys coming in. Um, and so when he, him and his family, they had planned this, this trip and they were gonna go on a cruise. And so he's excited, family's changing, family's happy, wife is excited about the results that she's seeing in her husband, and the kids are excited about the results they're seeing in dad, and everything is running smoothly. And I'm thinking like, man, this is awesome. Ryan, the greatest therapist in the world. Um, and then everything took a turn for the worse. So he goes, they got their cruise, they're gonna go on a Disney cruise, the whole thing. And so they get there for, I don't know, I think it was a week cruise. And right before he got through the door, I mean, here are their bags, the kids are excited, everyone is, you know, like running towards the ship, and then he receives a phone call. And as soon as he receives a phone call, his wife is looking at him because we know that that phone is a trigger, that that phone is a problem. It was something that she had complained oftentimes about, that he was always on the phone, he was always trying to handle business. And so in that moment, his phone rings, he looks at wife, wife looks at him, and he says, it's gonna be real quick, just give me a couple of minutes. He answers the phone, and he walks off and he's talking and talking, he's flaring his arm, he's making all these faces and his wife and his children are watching like, mm, what's gonna happen here? Well, he comes towards them, very saddened, very sorrowful, but he says, you guys go on ahead, right? You guys go on ahead and I'm gonna have to stay behind and handle this. Boom, in that moment now I had a problem, right? Because here was someone telling me that they wanted a happy family who started implementing different habits and different systems, but the problem is that the core of his identity was my job and my money. And whenever money and job was against family, family always lost, family always lost. Now, no one is, you know, we need money, we need to live, we live on planet Earth, we need jobs and we need money. The problem is what he was saying he wanted, which was a happy family, would always come into second place if it was against his job and if it was against money. At the core level of his identity, if that didn't change at the core level, it didn't matter what habits were created, what systems were created, he would always choose based on his identity. Does that make sense? That is why first level of change is great. Second level of change is great. They're all needed and necessary levels of change. But until my client was able to change at an identity level, he still behaved in a way that went against what he said he wanted. Now I'm gonna give you another example here. Um, they did a study a couple years ago, a few years ago, because now it would be very unethical to do this study. Hey, we're getting more people here. Hey, Nani and Natasha, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are trying to figure out here the single simple formula that can change our lives from unsatisfying to satisfying. And although it's simple, it's not easy, but it's possible. And so we... The study that was shown, it was um, what they did is they got a dog 
and they got this dog and they put him inside of a cage. When they put the dog inside of the cage, they locked the door and they started to shock the dog, okay, over and over and over again. In the beginning, the dog would yelp and he would scream and he would cry and he would try to get out of the cage. But after he was being shocked so many times, after a while he just sort of rolled over and gave up. And so he would just lay in the cage receiving all of these shocks. Well, after, I don't know if it was a couple of days or a couple of weeks, the researcher opens the cage and continues to shock the dog. And guess what happens? Even though the gate is open, even though the dog can leave, the dog does not leave. The dog just sits there. The researchers had to physically drag the dog out of the cage. You see, that's identity level. The dog was not liking the outcomes, but he got so used to his situation that even though there was now another opportunity, level two, the situation was different. Let's say the environment was different. The cage was now open. He could not leave. Why? Because in identity level, he already accepted the fact that I'm going to stay in this cage and I'm going to get shocked. That's exactly what was happening for my client. Although he said he wanted a happy family at the identity level, what reigned supreme in his heart and in his soul and in his identity was money and job, which is why he had no problem saying, you guys go ahead on the cruise and I'm going to catch you guys later. And so now I had a problem because I was trying to create changes that he wanted. We were formulating habits and systems However, at his core level, nothing was changing. And so he kept repeating the same behavior that he didn't want. Does that make sense? Okay. And finally, we see this play out in the Bible. Remember the Israelites? The Israelites, they were enslaved by Egypt. And their lives were miserable. Their lives were absolutely miserable. They had to build huge pyramids. And they didn't, you know, they didn't get what they deserved to get, meaning in terms of money, in terms of they suffered and they were beaten and they were abused and mistreated. And they prayed and prayed that God would send a deliverer. And so God did. A man named Moses. And Moses went there and delivered the Israelites out of that situation. They were the dogs in the cage, and now the cage was opened. And Moses dragged them out of the cage. But here's the problem. Although God delivered them, they were no longer in Egypt. They still had Egypt in their hearts. It was easier to take the Israelites out of Egypt than to take Egypt out of the hearts of the Israelites. And guess what? Even though they were free, even though they were no longer enslaved, when they were in the desert, a much better situation than being in Egypt. When God was trying to lead them to a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a place where they were no longer going to be beaten and abused, yet in the desert they complained. They said, oh, it was so much better for us in Egypt. Really? Getting beaten and abused and starving and seeing your children become enslaved? You see, at an identity level, at a core level, although they were out of Egypt, Egypt was still very much alive in their hearts and their identity. And so, so now what? Okay, Amanda, I, I get it. I understand. So thoughts lead to actions. Actions lead to habits. Habits form my character and character leads me to my destiny. Character determines destiny. So if character determines my destiny, and right now I am living results and outcomes based on the choices that I made in the past. Remember, you are not who you had to be. You are who you chose to be. And if that is the case, that today I'm living results and outcomes that I do not like, there's no one else to blame but me. And so when someone doesn't like the results and the outcomes in their lives, it, and when they try to do something about it, they start to see, how am I going to change? And we just saw that there's three levels of change. There's the outcome level, the process level, and the identity level. All three levels are important, but tonight I want to challenge you that we need to change the direction of change. Instead of focusing on outcome, the results, what do I want, we're going to flip it and say, who do I want to become? That is the question we have to answer tonight. Who do you want to become? Don't focus on the results. Don't focus on what you're living right now, but choose tonight who you want to become, right? So here's the next formula. The reason why I need to be asking who I want to become and not what do I want is because your current results, your behaviors 
are a result of both your identity and your environment. And I'm about to show you the formula, okay? So your current results, your behavior is the combination of identity, who you are, and your environment. If I don't like my behaviors, if I don't like my current situation, I need to take a look at identity and environment. And one simple formula can change your unsatisfying life. While it is simple, it is not easy. And here's why it's not easy. Because if I want to avoid regret in my future, let's say, and the destiny, I have to choose discomfort right now. I'm going to say it again. If you want to avoid regret in the future, you need to choose right now to experience discomfort. Why? Because identity change hurts. You are maybe like this dog in the cage that you've gotten used to this situation. Maybe like the Israelites, you've gotten used to, to Egypt, right? And so right now we're about to open the door of the cage, but you might need to be dragged out. Why? Because identity change is uncomfortable. But unless you change your identity now, you're going to continue making choices today, tomorrow, next week, next month, and you're going to arrive, whether it's five, 10, or 15 years down the line, to a destiny that you're gonna say, I, I didn't wanna be here. I hate it here. And so it's better to experience discomfort today than to experience regret tomorrow, okay? And so what then is the formula? Let me pull it up here. I wrote this one down for you too, and I'm gonna show it. It's very simple. Write it down. Don't forget it. All right, here we go. Can everyone see that? All right, so B equals I plus E. So behavior is the result or equals my identity partnered with my environment. So you have right now two charts, whatever, two graphs that should be on your paper. The first one is this one, the three levels of change, outcome, process, and identity. And the second thing you now have on your paper is behavior is the result of my identity plus my environment. Okay, very good. For those of you who are coming in, welcome, welcome, hi, it's good to have you here. You're sort of catching us in the middle of this thing, um, but that's okay, stay with us, send your questions. If you're confused, I'll try to, to catch you up to speed, but don't worry, everything is being recorded, right, Renee? <laughs> Renee, Renee forgot to, pl to press record the last time, but he remember this time, and it's all being recorded, and it's going to be on YouTube, on Facebook, every which place you could find it, it will be there so that you can watch it. But don't forget, we're doing these lives every Wednesday at 8 p.m., so make sure you set an alarm there so that you can join us. Okay, so that's the formula right now that you just wrote on your paper. Behavior equals your identity meets your environment. Now, your identity right now, who you are today, right? The results of your life is based on your identity. Now you might be thinking, well, if I don't have the results that I want, if I am currently living an unsatisfying life, then it's probably because I am not who I think I am. Or the opposite is also true. Maybe what I think I want in terms of what would make me happy isn't really what is making me happy. Does that make sense? And so I need to then focus on identity. And if I focus on identity, the question is, Amanda, you're telling me that I'm not getting the results that I want because at an identity level, at a core level, I am not aligned. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And so what do I do? How do I change? Here's the question. If behavior is the result of identity and environment and I'm not liking my current behaviors, it means I have to change my identity and it means I have to change my environment. And so the follow-up question would be, well, how do I change my identity? Okay, if you're coming in, you're coming in at just the right time because we just discovered the formula that is a simple formula that's going to change your unsatisfying life. Behavior equals identity plus environment. How do I change my identity because I'm not having the results that I want in my life? Well, the first 
way, well, the first thing you need to do, it's a two-part thing that you need to do to change your identity. Write it down. Number one, you need to determine, you need to decide who you want to become. Who do you want to become? When you have decided, when you have chosen who you want to become, then comes part two, where every single day you are going to cast votes, small, medium, and large ways. Every single day you are going to cast votes based on the identity that you have chosen for yourself. So let me give you an example. This, this morning, I went to go speak at um, a school in Tampa, North Tampa North Academy. <laughs> I don't even know. I just, I went on ways and I got there. And so anyways, I went to the school to speak there and I asked the students a question. And the question that I asked for them was this. None of them were married, okay? They were middle and high schoolers. And I asked them, and I specifically asked them this question because they were not married. But I asked them, I said, hey, what does it take to have a good marriage? And amazingly enough, they had tons of responses, loyalty and communication and intimacy and compassion, trust. They had tons, a series of response to give me, Amanda, in order to have a happy marriage, you need this, 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 and this, and this. And so, even though you might not be married, you know whether because a good marriage was shown to you, or maybe the opposite, whether your parents had a great marriage or a crappy marriage, you know what you want based on, I want what they had, or I want the opposite of what they had. You don't have to be who you want to become right now to know what it takes to become what you're saying you want to become. Does that make sense? So even though you're not married, you still know what a good marriage would look like. And so you can choose to become something that you're not currently living out. Does that make sense? So when you decide who you want to become, then you start to cast votes so that that identity is strengthened. You might not have that current identity now, but as you keep casting votes towards that identity, that identity will be strengthened in such a way that now it's going to be part of your character. Why? Because the Bible is clear. By beholding, we become changed. And what is change? Change is a change of habits. And what is a habit? It's imitation and then it's practice. You find who you want to become, you imitate that thing, and then you practice it over and over and over again. That's why Paul says to the church, hey, imitate me. And you think, man, well, Paul's kind of cocky, right? He's kind of arrogant. What do you mean imitate you? He says, imitate me because I imitate Christ. Look in my life imitate it and practice it over and over and over again because that's what I'm doing in the life of Christ. And so I become so identified with Christ that you can look into my life and you can become like Christ simply by looking at me. And so that's what we want to do. And so I'm going to give you an example of this to try to make it even more clear. I, I don't know about you, but I like stories and I like examples. It kind of helps bring everything together. So right now the formula is this. B equals I for identity plus E for environment. How do I change an unsatisfying life? How do I change the results that I'm currently living, the outcome that I hate, that I detest? There are three levels of change, right? We have outcome, process, and identity, but I'm challenging you that although all levels are important, instead of coming at it this way, meaning I'm going to chain I'm, I'm gonna focus on my outcome and then I'm gonna create processes and hope to God my identity changes no no no, no. you got to go that way you got to start with identity choosing who you want to become start creating processes and environment habits and then the results are going to speak for themselves if I have apple seeds in my hands and I plant it on the ground I am going to have an apple tree. I don't have to cross my fingers and hope to God that an apple tree will come out of apple seeds. And so I don't need to focus on the results. I need to focus on the identity. Okay, we're together. So now let's take a look at the life of one of my favorite characters of the Bible. Maybe he's a favorite character for you. 
it's Joseph. Now, as I keep going forward here, I know I talk a gazillion miles an hour, but if something is confusing, send your questions. Send your questions here. I can see you. I can see everyone who's who's joining. I know we, we have a team here on Instagram. Those who are on Facebook, even though I can't see you, Renee is sending the questions to me or on YouTube, but send your questions here so that we can clarify anything that might have been confusing. All right, so let's take a look at Joseph and his ability to change his identity, create process, and then create the outcome that he desired. He went from a unsatisfying life to a satisfying life simply because of a change in identity. So look, remember Joseph, he was the guy, he was the favorite of his brothers. And his father made that very obvious. His father, you know, made him a beautiful colored robe and says, oh, my favorite son, here you go. <laughs> Obviously, the other brothers, they were pissed off. They were angry. They were jealous. And, you know, that was not the, the nicest thing in the world to do. But Joseph, I mean, Joseph was the teacher's pet. He was the mama's boy, right? He was the suck up. And so when his brothers see that not only did he get this colorful robe, but then he, all the coat, but then he also starts talking about all these dreams that he's having that one day, right? His brothers are going to bow down to him. And not only his brothers, but even his parents are going to bow down. I mean, they lose it. And so Joseph one day goes to meet them to bring them food. They're over there tending to the father's flock. And the brothers come together and say, you know, let's get rid of this dreamer. Let's throw him in a dish. Well, long story short, the throw him in a ditch becomes sell him into slavery. And in order to cover up what they did, they take away that colorful, colorful, did I say that right? <laughs> colorful robe and they dip it in blood and animal's blood. And they go back home and say, look, dad, a wild animal, you know, devoured your son. Now, when Joseph was sold, sitting butt naked in the caravan, again, they, took his clothes, here he is sitting butt naked in a caravan and the current result of his life, the outcome of his life is awful, it's miserable, it sucks. But Joseph does something amazing and I'm gonna read it to you. There's a, an incredible book that I like, it's called Patriarchs and Prophet, written by a woman named Ellen White and talking specifically about this and I'm gonna read it because I think it's important that we look at this together. Look at what she says. As the caravan journeyed southward towards the borders of Canyon, the boy could discern in the distance the hills among which lie his father's tent. This is Joseph. He looks behind, sees his father's tent, and, and he's upset. He knows he's never going to see his father again. There's no Facebook. There's no Instagram. There's no cell phones. He's never going to see his dad again. And he says, bitterly, he wept at the thought of that loving father and his loneliness and affliction. With trembling heart, he looked toward the future. The results were awful, and it made him look into the future with discouragement. What a change in situation. Look at the difference. Look at the change from the tenderly cherished son to the despised and helpless slave, alone and friendless. What would be his lot in the strange lands to which he was going? And for a time, temporarily, for a moment, she says that Joseph gave himself up to uncontrollable grief and terror. But then something amazing happens. But, like what she says, in the providence of God, even this experience was to be a blessing to him. You might be living results and outcomes right now that you are unhappy with because of choices that you made in the past or maybe because of things that others did to you. But even this if used correctly, can be used as a blessing from God. Look at what he says. Look at what she says. He learned in a few hours that which years might not otherwise have taught him. His father, strong and tender as his love had been, had done him wrong by his partiality and indulgence. When he was living at mommy and daddy's house and being showed all this favoritism, his father and his toxic love for him was developing character traits that were not beneficial to Joseph. It says, this unwise preference had angered his brothers and provoked them to the cruel deed that separated him from his own, meaning he was sold into slavery. And its effects were manifest also in his characters. Faults had been encouraged that were now being corrected. 
He was becoming self-sufficient and exacting. Accustomed to the tenderness of his father's care, he felt that he was unprepared to cope with the difficulties before him and the bitter, uncared for life of a stranger and a slave. So this is why he gave himself up almost to uncontrollable terror and grief. Why? Because he thought, how can I go from a cherished mama's boy to now I'm on my own. I am a friendless, helpless slave. But now look at what happens. Joseph is going to make a decision to become something different than his current situation. Joseph understands that behavior is the result of identity and environment, and he is going to choose to focus on who I want to become, not what do I want. Look at what he said. Well, look at what it says. His thoughts turned to his father's God. In his childhood, he had been taught to love and fear God. Now all these precious lessons came vividly before Joseph and Joseph believed that the God of his fathers would be his God. And here's a secret. He then and there gave himself fully to the Lord and prayed that the keeper of Israel would be with him. Now look, his soul thrilled with high resolve to prove himself true to God under all circumstance to act as became a subject of the king of heaven. He would serve the Lord. This is what he is choosing to become. He would serve the Lord with undivided heart. He would meet the trials of his lot with fortitude and perform every duty with fidelity. One day's experience had been the turning point in Joseph's life. Today, tonight can be the turning point of your life. Its terrible calamity had transformed him from a petted child to a man that was thoughtful, courageous, and self-possessed. Can you imagine? It's brilliant. It's absolutely amazing. The, the, the suck up, the teacher's pet, the mama's boy, you know, the, the favorite. He, in that moment, decided that his life was not going to be that. He chose who he wanted to become. And from that day forward, what did he do? Every single opportunity that he got, he would cast a vote to his new identity. And what was that new identity? That he was going to serve God with an undivided heart. That he was going to meet all of the trials, all the circumstances and all the situations of his life with fortitude, with fidelity, with loyalty, and with integrity, no matter what. That's the choice that he made. Even though his results in that moment sucked, he was a butt-naked slave and a caravan. Okay, now look. How did he cast his votes? As soon as he arrives at Potiphar's house, it says that this man, he worked so diligently and so faithful. Potiphar was watching him and said, man, everything this boy touches turns into gold. Why? Remember, he had chosen that he was going to do everything with determination and grit and perseverance. And so, of course, Potiphar says, listen, you're in charge of everything here. And now, here comes another test. Here comes another trial. Potiphar's wife, and I mean, she's a babe, okay? She's hot, she smells good. She's after Joseph. And yet again, Joseph remembers who he said he wanted to become, and he cast a vote towards who he wants to become. And he was capable of saying to that woman, no, I will not sleep with you. And then he says, how can I do this great wickedness before God? Meaning, I have chosen my identity and I am a a representative of the king of the universe, and this behavior is not in line with who I chose to become. Second time, the third time, he, because he did not sleep with that woman, it cost him, honestly, prison. And so he goes to prison, and even in prison, he is loyal to God, he is faithful to God. Circumstance sucks, results in the moment sucks, but he knows who he has chosen to become. His identity is in line. And what happens even in prison, the guards respect him in such a way that even in prison, he starts to make progress and he becomes in charge of the prison. Joseph then becomes the one that God will use to save the people from famine. Not only did he save the Egyptians from famine, but he saved the world at large, the Hebrews, because of Joseph. The world was able to keep going. No one died of famine. And guess what? Even when his brothers go there, without knowing that it's Joseph, his brothers show up. And when Joseph had the opportunity to pay back for revenge, what does Joseph do? Joseph forgives his brother. Why? Because of a choice that he made when he was just a boy sitting naked in a caravan that he was going to become who God wanted him to be. And guess what? Joseph proves to us when we know who we are, 
when our identity is fixed, that environment, although influences us, does not determine us. Did you catch that? His environment, his surroundings, sure, it had an influence, it had an impact, but it did not determine him because he knew who he was. We'll look at another example. Moses. <laughs> We're looking at another thing. Renee looked at me, so I thought he, he had something to say. Okay, welcome, welcome. More people coming in. So now let's look at Moses. Moses was the prince of Egypt, right? Moses, when he was a little boy, his mom had to put him in a basket for his life, to save his life. And the princess finds him, has compassion on him, and decides to adopt him. And she raises him as the prince of Egypt, but his identity was Hebrew at heart. So much so that when he grows up to become a man and he knows that God has a mission from, isn't that incredible? His mother, Jochebed, had instilled such a strong identity in him that even, look at this, even though he grew up in an environment where he was a prince of Egypt, his environment did not determine him. It influenced him, meaning, you know, he knew how to use weapons and he knew different languages and he knew arts and history. He was put in the best schools that Egypt had to offer. However, the environment influenced him, but it did not determine him because his identity was so fixed and ingrained into the fiber of his being by his mother, Jochebed. Now look, look at what happens. Joseph also had something else ingrained in his identity. He was very proud. He was a prideful man. And when he realizes, hey, God is going to use me and the time is now, we know what, this, what happens with the story. Joseph responded as a Hebrew because he was, right? His mom had ingrained this into him, but he had a character defect. And that character defect was that he was proud, that he thought that God wanted him to do this thing all on his own. And so the first chance he gets, he sees two Hebrews fighting, arguing, and he tries to split it up, right? So here we go, he tries to do things on his own. He's proud, and so what? That identity of I got this, I could do this on my own, made him react behavior in a way that he wasn't supposed to. Oh, hey, 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 Chris coming in. Yes, don't worry. These lives are being recorded by Renee, and so we are going to make them available. But remember, next week, join us at 8 p.m. on Wednesday so that you can ask questions and, and be part of our community here. But I'm glad that you sort of joined here in the end. But yes, everything will be recorded, okay? And so now we're looking at the identity of Moses, right? Remember, behaviors are the result of your identity plus your environment. And so even though Moses was the prince of Egypt, his identity was so ingrained in him by his mother, Jochebed, that he knew that he was a Hebrew. And when he saw those Hebrews fighting, those men fighting, he tried to split them up. But Joseph also had a character defect. It was his pride. And so then he sees a soldier harassing a Hebrew, and what does he do? He kills the soldier and buries him and flees for his life. When he gets in the middle of the desert and he sees these men picking on the women, he also sort of shoes him away. Everything that Moses does is based on his biceps, is based on his pride. And so God does something incredible with Moses. Look at this. For Joseph, Joseph chose to become someone who is going to remain faithful to God despite the circumstances and his situations. And God had to change the environment of Joseph. Remember, he was the petted, pampered little boy. But in a moment, in a second, at a change of environment, even though it was an environment that wasn't the best of environment, God even used that to change his behaviors. And now Moses is going to experience something similar. What happens in the life of Moses? Well, Moses went from the palace to the desert. And God would leave Moses in the desert for 40 years. The current behaviors in Moses' life was not something that he was proud of. He was a murderer. He was a fugitive. Why? Behaviors is the result of our identity meets our environment. His identity in that moment was proud, hubris, arrogant, cocky. And his environment in that palace brought out all of these things in him. But when God changed his environment and Moses decided and allowed God 
to change his identity, what happens? The proudest man in the world becomes the most humble man in the world. And after 40 years in the desert, when God shows up to Moses in the burning bush and says, Hey, Moses, I have chosen you to go and deliver the Israelites out of Egypt. What does Moses say? No, 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 you can't possibly choose me. We see a change in Moses. Why? Did the results change? No, no, no. Moses chose. He decided to change his identity. God allowed for habits, behaviors, and circumstance. He was now in a different environment. And the result, what? The proud man became the most humble man. Now look, I'm going to land this plane. And I want you to remember a few things. Your behavior that you might not like right now, it can be changed. Your unsatisfying life, it can be changed. In fact, it must be changed. Remember, character determines destiny. And although there are three levels of change, you're looking at the results in your life and you're thinking, I don't want this. I don't want this result. If you don't change at an identity level though, those changes are gonna be very short term. They're gonna be short lived. You might change for a week and maybe a month, but if you don't change at the core level, if you don't change your beliefs and your values and your principles, if you don't decide right now who you want to become, it's only gonna be a matter of time before you're doing the things that you said you didn't want to do. That's why God says, hey, I want to change your heart. Give me your heart. What is he saying? I want to change you at an identity level. God is not satisfied with behavior modification. He wants heart transformation. Why? Because he knows if our hearts are transformed, the behaviors are going to follow. But we don't change our hearts by changing behaviors. We change our hearts and the behaviors will follow. And God, yes, he might use your environment, but you will quickly see that. If you take on a new identity, I had a client of mine and he decided that he no longer wanted to be an alcoholic. He's an alcoholic his whole life. His grandfather was an alcoholic. His father was an alcoholic. And well, he was an alcoholic. And for him, he had this identity so ingrained with him, sort of this generational curse. All the men in his life were alcoholics. And so he says, man, it's so hard to change this identity. And so you know what he started to do? He started to change his environment and he started to surround himself with different people. And guess what? As he chose to become something different, I no longer identify as an alcoholic. Automatically, his environment changed. He no longer felt comfortable going to the same places because when we change our identity, our environment changed. And sometimes when we place ourselves in the correct environment, it helps strengthen our identity. Both of them are working together. If you're saying, I want to be someone who is fit, I want to be an athlete. And maybe it's really hard right now. Maybe the results you're looking, you're looking at, you're looking at yourself and thinking, well, this doesn't look like an athlete. Well, change the environment every single day, go to the gym and start to identify with that lifestyle, start to identify with that identity. And so this is what God tells you you are. And so I, you know, God doesn't tell you what the results in your life need to be. God tells you who you are because he knows that if you would just believe it, that the results would be natural. They would be automatic. They would be obvious in your life. So God says this, I, I put down some of my favorites. He says, you are loved. You are redeemed. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are forgiven. You are capable. You are strong. You are valued. You are chosen. That's the identity that God has given me. And when I believe in these things, and then when I make habits and processes and systems, and I cast votes based on this identity, the results are going to show in my life. And so again, look, when you focus on identity, the results will take care of itself. So it's not outcome, process, identity. It's identity, process, and outcome. Who do you want to become? Remember the client that I shared? The one who said he wanted a happy family? Well, when he decided that a happy family means that I want to be a great father and I want to be a great husband. And I asked him, well, what does that look like? Someone who is a great father, what are some of the character traits? What are some of the traits that they have? And he made a list of that. Well, this is what it means to be a great husband. Well, what does it mean to be a great father? Amanda, well, this is what it means to be a great father. I said, do you, you want to become these things? Yes, I want to become these things. So I returned to him the, the paper that he did to me. And I said, okay, since you have chosen that this is going to be your identity, you are going to live out all of these characteristics that you said every single day. Right now, you don't feel like a good husband. 
Right now, I don't feel like a good father, but you are going to cast votes to this new identity that you have chosen. And so he did every single day, strengthening that identity, strengthening that identity, casting votes in small, medium, and large ways every single day. And guess what was the results? The results was natural. It was organic. It was automatic. When he focused on identity, the results came. So the question you need to be asking tonight isn't what do I want? Stop focusing on the current results, but decide who you want to become. And every single day in small, medium, and large ways, cast the vote to strengthen your identity. All right. I think that's it. I think I got it. Listen, that's what I have for you tonight. Please, please, please. If you are just joining us now, don't worry. Everything is being recorded. It's going to be put sometime this week and you will be able to watch it. But I encourage you, I encourage you to join us at 8 p.m. every single Wednesday because then you can ask your questions here and I can answer it to you live and I can clarify things. But again, um, you can watch the recording. It's going to be there. And if you watch the recording and you have questions or whatever, you can send me a direct message through Instagram or however you can access me through Facebook and I will answer those questions for you. So remember, what is the game changer? What is the simple formula that changes an unsatisfying life? It's B for behavior is equal to I identity plus E environment. If you want to change your results, if you want to change the outcome, focus on who you want to become and use your environment for your advantage so that environments, they influence you, but they don't determine you. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio and Will. Thank you. I hope that was helpful to you. Thank you, you guys for coming in and joining me. This is what we're doing every single week. I'm trying to change and develop my character so that I can arrive at the destiny that God has in mind for me. And my prayer is that you will do the same. And together, we can be a community with transformed characters because remember, character determines destiny. I'll see you guys next week.